and death Christ alone, Christ alone and What is our only confidence That our souls to Him belong Who holds our days within His hand What comes apart from His command what will keep us to the end the love of christ in which we stand oh sing hallelujah our hope springs eternal oh sing hallelujah now and ever we confess our hope in life and death. What truth can calm the troubled soul? God is good, God is good. Where is His grace and goodness known? In our Let's go, Romans 15, starting in verse 14. Now remember, we said last week that with verse, between verse 13 and 14, Paul wraps up the main teaching portion of his letter. And he begins to address the Romans in a very personal way. And he shares his heart about himself with them in, these final, uh, in this final, for us, chapter and a half. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. But on some points, I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God 
to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience, by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, that I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. Let's pray. Our Father, uh, we bow before you, we have, uh, we have worshipped, um, and Lord, we worship as um, the church militant on this day. But one day we will join the church triumphant, and we will sing, and we will come before you. But thank you for a taste of heaven this morning. Thank you for the truth of heaven as you've given us your word. Lord, may we not be quick to push it aside. May we not just try to get through this, but may we, uh, may we, may we in all humility learn and may we, may we live the truth of your word. Open our eyes that we'll see, our ears that we'll hear. We thank you for the amazing things that took place on this campus this past week. We thank you for the, uh, the lasting effect and impact that decisions uh, that were made will have, not just on Kaioki, but on your kingdom in general. Thank you for the investment of the body of Christ into those that in many cases, of many of these children leading into Monday were not a part of your kingdom. Not a part of your body. They were maybe part of our family, biologically. But now have a heavenly father. You do that. <laughs> we would never draw it up like you have designed it. We thank you for your design more than our drawings. Now, Father, um, as we consider a what a satisfi satisfied life looks like, may we do it to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. What is it that produces or constitutes a satisfied life? Think about that for just a minute. Um, what, what are you looking to and building on that will lead you to say this is worth building my life upon what would that be if 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 we had a snapshot of you on this day what would and you look back what would you offer to us that you have predicated success for you for your family, based on fill in the blank. What brings to you and do you consider, when I get this, when I achieve that, then I'll be satisfied? Or maybe, as we consider the, the mission dignity, uh, when you are about to breathe your last, what do you want to be able to say to your family? Maybe to the Lord, this was the basis of satisfaction. Will you be satisfied in your source of satisfaction? 
uh, a, a, a little bit of an amusing story. When, um, when I, I was in seminary, uh, one of, you've, pro- you've heard me mention this name, uh, one of our professors, just an incredibly godly man and, and learned man, Curtis Vaughn, uh, taught, he was a New Testament professor, so he taught different New Testament books. And um, in, in, in our class on Hebrews, there was a, there was a student who, as, as we were going over, it was the first day of class of the semester, and uh, the way Dr. Vaughn does it is he would pass out a syllabus, and he would not cover everything, but he would want you to set your eyes on it and make sure that if you had questions that you would, you would ask them on that day because he didn't want to get midway or toward the end of the semester and anybody saying, I didn't know I had to do this or that. And one of the things in all of Dr. Vaughn's classes that were on, on books, individual New Testament books, was you had to do a paper that consisted of four sermons, a complete commentary of whatever the book was, and, um, and, some, and, and some personal remarks alongside it. And this particular, you know, as, as he's telling this, uh, uh, this particular student said, Dr. Vaughn, I, I don't quite understand what you're asking for in our paper because uh, it was the end of the semester paper it was the last thing you turned in and and about 80 percent of your grade was going to be based on this paper right he gave just a couple of tests and this paper and this what, what i don't understand how how if we're having two tests and everything else is based on this paper what exactly are are you looking for and dr vaughn who did not suffer fools easily smiled and said, well, we just went over that. What don't you understand? And uh, he said, well, when you say four sermons, are those, do you want them literal word-for-word sermons? Do you want an outline? And Dr. Vaughn said, I want four sermons. And he said, well, when you, and so we were ready, and he raises his hand again, and he said, Dr. Vaughn, when you say we've got to do a commentary, do you mean like a devotional commentary, or do you mean an intense commentary that includes the Greek and everything? And um, Dr. Vaughn <laughs> walked from his podium, and he walks over, and he stands in front of the guy, and he said, son, here, here's what I want in this paper. On your deathbed, when you have just a few breaths left in you before you go stand before the Lord, I want you to muster all the strength you have. And I want you to turn to your wife who's at your bedside. And I want you to tell her to come closer and come even closer and she's waiting for your final words and it's emotional in the room and I want you to look at her and I want you to say sweetheart bring me my Hebrews paper (laughs) no more questions no more questions that was his sense of satisfaction (laughs) A good paper on Hebrews. What is yours? What, what, maybe it's a lot of money. Maybe it's a lot of children. Maybe it's grandchildren or great grandchildren. Maybe it's a, there are all kind of things. Career success. What do you view right now today what is the basis of your life and I belabor that because in our passage the apostle Paul gives a picture of what brought him satisfaction notice notice in verse 14 
um, he says, or he writes, I myself am satisfied. Now stop, don't read any, any more. I am satisfied. This is Paul saying, I am satisfied. That, to us, in fact, it's really the basis of this message, should be compelling. Because if you're a Christian, you, like me, probably consider the Apostle Paul one of the the godliest, most Christ-honoring men that's ever lived. Perhaps, if not the greatest mind that's ever lived, one of the greatest minds. If you're not a Christian, you cannot deny the impact of, of Paul. And isn't it fascinating that he would say, this is what satisfies me. This is the basis in which I write to you. This is what I have built my life on. And what I'm asking you is, can you make that statement about about yourself? That you are satisfied in what? In what? Now, back to verse 14 in Paul. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers. I sometimes think I love the church, and I know I love you. Paul loved the church. He never been to Rome I know three dog night had never made it to Spain and at this point in time neither had Paul but as we're going to see next week he had planned he pla- he's planning on it getting to Spain and he's planning on, on on his way to Spain stopping at Rome but he w- he could say this is what brings me satisfaction you you this church and I wonder if you could say that about your church. Now, maybe you're, not a, maybe you're not a member here. Maybe you're a guest, a visitor. Maybe you, know, you were here for VBS or here for something else. But you've got a church home. I hope you can say this of your church. But this church, our church, Kaioki, the Lord's church here, can you say... You are my satisfaction. And if you can't, why can't you? Uh, here, I'm, not, I'm not asking you to make something up and lie and be somebody or have thoughts that you really don't have. Don't profess to be something you're not. I, myself, I'm satisfied about you, Paul says to the Rome, church at Rome. Are you satisfied? Do you look at what God is doing in the midst of your brothers and sisters? Do you find purpose and meaning in that? Do you find joy in that? You watch a video like we watched earlier and go, yeah, that was cute. Or do you see the work of God? Do you sing the lyrics that we've offered to the Lord this morning? Do you sit and listen as the choir is leading us in that amazing anthem? And does it connect? Or is it just part of the worship service? Brings you closer to lunch. Can you look at people that you know maybe some better than others? And can you honestly say, I myself am satisfied about you? Now, I don't want to give the false impression, and I know we we got six points to cover, and... and, um, um, but this is a point. It's just unlabeled. 
It's just the, the, t- the heading of the message because it seems like what gives Paul satisfaction is simply people, right? And at that point in time, you know, we could, we could be pretty much any social organization finding satisfaction in friends and neighbors and, and the organization itself. But here's what we have to realize is when you read Paul, you recognize that the reason people matter so much, the reason the church in Rome mattered so much, and by the way, he could say this of a lot of churches, but he's saying it to the Romans in, in, right here, is that he can say that because God matters so much. That's the basis in him saying, I myself am satisfied about you because he was satisfied in God, in his Savior. In fact, God matters more to the Apostle Paul than people matter to the Apostle Paul. That's why he was the Apostle Paul. If we are ever going to do all the great things that God would have us do, we are going to have to get to the point where we say the most important person in our lives as individuals, the most important person in the life of Kaioki is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's, and, and it's his opinion that will bring about our desires and it is his his hope and his word that will shape and mold what brings us satisfaction because if it's not then we're setting ourselves up for not only failure but for a lot of misery i can tell you and and many of you don't need me to tell you this because you've experienced it as well. If your satisfaction is solely on people, let's say if your satisfaction is solely in your family, well, families, marriages break up, children die, and if that's ultimately what brings you your satisfaction, pretty temporary. Even if they last for 60 years, still temporary in light of eternity. God is the ultimate one that Paul lives for and seeks to please. And this allows him to love these people in a way much more deeply than he ever could otherwise. And I I think we fail to understand that you can never love someone ultimately to the deepest point until you love the Lord more. Otherwise, you're settling for this. (laughs) There's got to be this. In fact, uh, the, the... the title of the message is A Satisfied Life, but you'll see on your outline um, that it's not, it's not supposed to say a vertical with horizontal consequences. That's my bad. It's supposed to say a vertical life with horizontal consequences in six words. That's why we can be at 916 and me be pretty confident we're going to get through this. It's just six words. But we've talked throughout Romans about this being connected to the Lord, this vertical relationship, and how it impacts this, the horizontal relationship. And because Paul sought ultimately to know Christ and to be satisfied in Christ, it allowed him to find satisfaction in the body of Christ, in the church of Christ. 
A truly satisfied life is a vertical life. It is a vertical affection. It is a life centered on Jesus. And when that's the case, there are always horizontal consequences. The Bible does not know of somebody that loves God, loves the Word of God, but doesn't care for the people of God. Now, it knows of people. I mean, back to Hebrews. I mean, the writer of Hebrews had to admonish his readers. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. There's value in being together all throughout Romans. I mean, this last section we have called not alone because this life is to be lived in relationship with other disciples. There are always horizontal consequences when the vertical is right. Because the vertical, it's not merely... Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. It is the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And, and the flip side of that is, if you're all in and invested in people, but you don't really care about you know, God, His Word, it's no big deal, as long as you love others. I, I, Rick, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, is he back there, or is that John? Uh, I don't know what I'm doing to make that popping. Uh, hopefully we'll have it ready by 11 o'clock. Won't do, won't do us right now any, any good. Um, so, with that understood, a vertical life with horizontal consequences, let's look at these six words that are, are, are really described here in our passage that point to a satisfied life. So here's the first one. The word is commend. Commend. Back to verse 14. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. Now here's the really cool thing. Up to this point, Paul has been writing to the church in Rome, to the believers in the church in Rome. But with beginning with verse 14, he begins to write about them. Let's talk about you. And in doing so, he reveals his own personal wants and desires, facts about him, what, what he wants to accomplish. And while Paul can be blunt in his writing, I mean, he can, he can upbraid you. If you are, if you're missing on this or this. But here he encourages his readers, this church. He calls out that they are full of goodness, filled or complete with knowledge, and able to instruct. That's not bad. To be acknowledged by the Apostle Paul that you're full of goodness, that you're filled with knowledge, and that you are able to instruct. And so that's what he writes. I just I, I, I mention it because I think part of a satisfied life is having the ability to get outside of your own skin, look at us, another person, and encourage them brag on them not lie about them but build them up what paul would say in his letter to the ephesians you know don't tear people down but let every word that you say to others build them up i know a lot of builders with their tongues and with their words a lot of them are in this room we probably all know, maybe not the same people, but we, there are people in our lives that are terror downers. The last thing they're going to do is commend somebody. And it gets back to, it's because they're not satisfied in themselves. And so quite often people spend a lot of time telling others how good they are and how satisfied they are when they're 
It's the farthest thing from the truth. Part of a satisfied life, a life that has been centered on the Lord and therefore is having a horizontal impact, is a life that encourages, builds up, equips, commends. Verse 15, But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder, because of the grace given me by God. It's the word illicit. Illicit with an E as you can see, not I. It, 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 it is to draw out of another person. Paul says, on, on, on some of the things that I've written you, I've done it very boldly in order to remind you of what you already knew. He is eliciting facts from them, things they know, actions they've taken. He wants to remind them of that. By the way, I, um, we, may, we may hit this a little bit harder next week, but um, you don't understand Paul and you don't understand Scripture. I say you, I mean that generically. We don't understand. If we kind of push down grace, Paul is all about grace. It's found throughout this passage, grace. He is who he is because of the grace of God. He can be satisfied in others because of the grace given him by God. And he wants them to be reminded, to, to, to have that drawn out of them. Verse 16, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God. Remember what he's unashamed of? The gospel? So that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. The word here is give. The word here is give. Paul views his own life as an offering to the Lord, and he views his ministry like a priest before the Lord, and particularly his ministry to the Gentiles, and he desires to offer them that it would be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. It's the, it's the well, we don't have, uh, let, let's, let's, fourth word, boast. Fourth word is boast. Verse 17, In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. Um, Paul here is boasting, but he's boasting in the Lord. Remember, he wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians if you boast, you boast in Christ. Here he's boasting in Christ. A satisfied life is not a life that is always poor, poor, pitiful me. A satisfied life is, can take stock of how God has blessed you and give thanks and praise and reason to the Lord. And Paul says, I won't speak of anything except what the Lord has done through me. Fifth word, that second part of verse 18. I'll not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed. The word is yield. He desires, in this case, the Gentiles would yield. By word and deed, one goes with the other. If I speak with the tongues of angels, but I live like a demon of hell, it doesn't work. Or if I am religious and mind my P's and Q's, but when I'm behind the scenes, I am backbiting and gossiping about other people, 
It doesn't work. I yield. Paul yielded his life, and we, he lived, did so in order that others would obey, would yield to the Spirit of God. Finally, verses 19 through 21, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. But can I just say this? The gospel had reached its easternmost limit. If, you could, if we were looking at a map and um, at, at the Middle East, by the time Paul writes to the, this letter to the Romans in around 55 to 57, it had reached its easternmost limit of his life. The rest of the growth of the church in Paul's life would be to the west. It would be toward Rome and it would be toward Spain. Verse 20, thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel. Remember what he's not ashamed of. Not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see. And those who have never heard will understand. The word is declared. It is declared. Paul would declare the name of Christ, the Word of God, to those who have never heard of Christ, who are unfamiliar with the Word of God. And we see that this is a reflection of just this great heart to see the lost come to Christ. What's a satisfied life? It is a life that is lived vertically unto the Lord and has horizontal consequences. Now, I started off by asking you, what would you build your life on? I wanted to just share a couple of brief quotes with you. Um, The comedian Jim Carrey, if you're real spiritual and you're into movies, Dumb and Dumber, that's Jim Carrey, right? Lloyd Christmas. Um... Listen to what he said. Quote, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. Hmm. Katy Perry, the, she's on some show, or she was on some show, American Idol maybe? I know she's a singer. I'm not that old yet. This is what she said. She posted this on Instagram uh, two years ago. 100 million digital singles, and still I'm insecure. What what, What would make a person secure? Well, just based on these quotes, it's not fame. It's not acceptance by the masses. Paul would say, it's this. It's Christ. And because Christ is the center of my life, it affords me, it allows me to do this. Go horizontal. What brings you what are you living for that you living for that you will die and it will determine was yours a satisfied life stand with me let's go to the lord there's an endless song waiting to The sound of every tongue when the bride of Christ on that day of days brings with joy unto the Lamb a multitude of praise and like the roar of mighty seas and rolls of thunder he 
salvation in his